OK, I'm continuing my series on explaining materialism. In the last video, I talked about classical materialism. In this one, I'm going to be talking about the materialist approach to understanding labour and purpose. In Capital, Marx gives a definition of what work is. He says, we presuppose labour in a form which stamps it as exclusively human. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst of architects from the best of bees is this that the architect raises his structure in the imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labour process we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the labourer at its commencement. He not only effects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realises a purpose of his own that gives a law to his modus operandi and to which he must subordinate his will. This account seems right, but if we think about it, I think we can go a bit further. There are problems with formulating it in this way. The first is, do animals really lack purpose? Spiders are so small and their brains so tiny that it's plausible that it's blind instinct rather than conscious prospect of flies that drives spiders to spin. But it's doubtful that applies to mammals. And even with spiders, there have in recent years been experiments done which show that spiders are actually capable of planning routes through a 3D scene, which they survey for a while Work, how they're going to get, work out how they're going to get somewhere, go there and then attach their thread to it. If we take an animal like a horse, the horse at the plough may not in, envisage in advance the corn that he helps to produce, but the horse is just a slave, bent to the purpose of the ploughman. Reduced to a source of mechanical power, Overcoming the dumb resistance of soil, he's readily replaced by a John Deere. But there are animals which have purpose. If a wolf is stalking its prey, doesn't it intend to eat it? It plans its approach with cunning. Who are we to say that the result, fresh caribou meat, did not already exist in the imagination of the wolf at its commencement? It is worth looking in more detail at the comparison between the architect and the bee. Marx remarks that bees put many architects to shame. And what are the habits of the architect compared to the habits of the bee? Well, something that's very noticeable about human architects is that they like right angles. Going down through the years, these right angles keep reappearing. Insects are different. Bees and wasps like hexagons. Again and again, we encounter among the social insects of the Hymenoptera, we encounter these hexagonal structures. Now let's compare them. Suppose you are tessellating a plane with squares. Let's assume they're unit squares. So each side is of length 1. It follows that the area of the square will also be 1. Now each square has four sides. But half of those sides are shared with its neighbours. So each square room actually has only two sides to call its own. 
and you therefore have a length of 2 per unit area, a length of wall of 2 per unit area. Let's contrast that with the hexagons the bees use. The, these have an amount of unit area, sorry, an amount of wall per unit area of 2 upon root 3 which gives us a reduction by a factor of root 3. It follows the honeycomb structure used by bees is more efficient in the use of wax than a rectilinear structure that uh, an architect would use. It's also true that the honeycomb structure is much more resistant to shear stress than a rectilinear structure is. I can prove the um, or anyone can prove the efficiency of the B structure by simple geometry. Suppose we have a hexagon with the, of unit side. It's made up of six identical equilateral triangles. And if T is the area of one equilateral triangle, the area of the whole hexagon is therefore going to be 6T. Now the area of a triangle is given by or an equilateral triangle of unit side is half base times height. Where the, the base here is going to be 1 and the height we can work out is going to be 3 over the square root of 3 over 4. How do we know it's going to be the square root of 3 over 4? Well by Pythagoras' theorem. We know that the square of unit 1 is equal to the square of that and that. Now that is a half, so squaring that we get a quarter, so this must be the square root of, the area of this must be three quarters and the length must be of it must be the square root of three quarters. The area of one hexagon is therefore three root three upon two. And the hexagon's six sides are shared 50% with a neighbour. It follows that the wall area of a hexagonal tessellation is therefore 3 over 3, upon, 3 root 3 upon 2, which is 2 divided by root 3, which is better than the area ratio for squares. Now, we needn't assume that the bees worked this out. They didn't do the maths and decide this is the best structure. But evolution has led to them adopting what is the best structure. And this was a structure way beyond what architects could achieve. Marx said the bees put the best architect to shame. Well, it wasn't until the mid-20th century that any architects caught up with the bees. That's the dome at Montreal that Buckminster Fuller designed hexagonal structure, beacomb-like bee structure of the struts. Structures like that actually arise in nature. They weren't discovered until the 1990s when it was discovered that there was a compound C60 which was given the name fullerene because of its similarity to Buckminster Fuller's Dale. It is in the form of a perfect icosahedron. It condenses out of the hellish heat of a carbon arc and it depends on the thermal vibrations to curve the familiar planar hexagonal lattice of graphite onto itself to form a three-dimensional structure. In this case no architect or bee is required and it is just heat and the atomic properties of carbon that select the structure length and give you a structure very like Buckminster Fuller's uh, domes. Back in the early 1970s when I was 18, Greg Michelson and I decided we wanted to go camping and couldn't afford a tent large enough to take a group of people. So we decided to build a um, geodesic dome as our tent. It was very cheap, much cheaper than the tent. 
we just got lengths of one by one light wood, cut them into one meter lengths, formed them into, in our case initially, a, a dodecahedron on top of which we set further triangular struts and covered it with sheet sheet of polythene which we cut into triangular pieces and welded together with a blowtorch. Now one of the things we noticed as we were building it was that in a sense it wanted to assume its final shape. As we put the, the struts in place it became more and more stable. When you started putting the thing up you needed people to hold pieces of it in place as you screwed the additional struts into place. But by the time you're getting to the upper triangles, the whole thing was already rigid and moved itself into a stable position. In this, it mimics the process of self-assembly that the fullerenes go through. Okay, we know that the bees don't do mathematical calculations to design their cells. But there's still the question of how do they actually build them? One possibility is that the beehive also gains its structure from a process of spontaneous pattern, pattern formation. But this doesn't actually tally up with the way the cells are built. The bees build the cells up from the base laying wax down on the upper margins of the cell walls, just as bricks are laid to the upper margin of a wall by a bricklayer. There's no doubt that the construction process does take account of the inherent stability of a hexagonal lattice, and thus allows the growing cells to form their own scaffolding. However, that doesn't answer the question the bees still need to have some kind of internal model or set of rules telling them how high to build the, the, the individual cells and how wide the individual cells unit struts are going to be. So in terms of internal purpose the bee has to have what Marx claimed was unique to the architect. It doesn't mean that the bee has a picture in its mind of what it's building, but if we use modern computer technology it has to be hardwired into the bee's brain to build that thing. The set of rules to go through to build it have to be hardwired into its brain. And that set of rules, encoded in its nervous system, are an internal representation of what it's going to produce. Now, let's turn to Marx's example of the architect. And here his argument looks even shakier. Because he says the architect builds the building in his imagination before he builds it in reality. But do architects ever build things themselves? Very rarely an architect might build his own home. But in general, what gives them the status of being architects is that they don't get their hands dirty with anything other than India ink. Architects draw up plans and then builders build. And I have to say that in slipping over this, this distinction, Marx shows a, a very uncharacteristic blindness to class reality. If we consider something big like an architect, like an office block, a stadium or a station, it does have a prior existence before it's put up by the builders. But that, that prior existence is as a plan on paper, not in the minds of builders. It isn't in the minds of the builders who put up the tower block what it's going to look like. If by collective labour civilised humans can put up structures more complex than bees, 
it's because they can read, write and draw and coordinate collective labour with written and drawn records. A plan, whether it's on paper as it now is, or as it used to be in the time when the ancient Greeks built their temples, the plan would actually be scribed onto the stone floor of the temple they were building. This plan coordinates the individual efforts of many humans into a collective effort. And this is what's genuinely different about human labour. The fact that we can direct the labour of a group of people using a materialised plan. Now, moving back from the builders to the architect, there's no doubt that an architect will have a broad outline of a design in their head when they start drawing. And as they transfer this to the paper, they get a context on the sheet of paper within which their mind can work to elaborate and fill in details. The details aren't all in their mind prior to starting work. They emerge through the interaction of mind, pen and paper. Pencils and paper don't just record ideas that exist fully formed. They're part of the very production process that generates the ideas in the first place. For building work then, Marx was partially right. The structure is raised on paper before it is raised in stone. But he's wrong in saying that it's built in the imagination first and implying that the structure is put up by the architect. What is really unique to humans here is first the social division of labour between the labour of conception by the architects and the work of execution by the builders and second the existence of materialised plans configurations of matter that control and direct the labour of groups of humans. Plans are something material. Ideas in someone's brain, well, they're things that you hypoth Marx hypothesised exists prior to the start, but that's essentially an idealist explanation. At any one time, our consciousness can only focus on a limited number of things. On the basis of what it is currently context, conscious of, its context, it can produce responses related to this context. In an activity like drawing a plan or an engineering diagram, the context has two parts, an internal state of mind and that part of the diagram or plan upon which visual attention is fixated. And the response you get is both internal, a new state of mind, and external, a movement of the pencil on the paper. Now, those of you who listened to my talk on Turing and his contribution to materialism will see that I'm giving a Turingist analysis of what an architect does. So, the concept of labour presented in capital still has a certain relic of idealism and anthropocentrism, but it's possible to have a more materialist analysis of this. And in the next talk, I'm going to be talking about purpose, work and entropy to see whether the concept of purpose and the concept of work are related at a more detailed, microscopic physical level.